All right. So we cover kind of the political history in very brief. Um, now we're moving to kind of what's going on edu with the educational system in China at the time. And this may have huge consequences because essentially it may have seriously misallocated, um, you know, Chinese, uh, essentially the elite, um, the elite intellectuals um, of, of the country. So we're going to be talking here about the imperial exam system. And so here we have a nice drawing of people taking these exams. And so basically, there, there was this system from 600 um, up, until, uh, up until 1900, um, which was kind of an entry into the bureaucratic uh, uh, elite. You, you would take these exams, and then you would get a civil service position, um, which was highly sought after. It was essentially like lifetime employment, um, you know, good lifestyle. And the way you got there, the exams, what they were testing on was the Confucian uh, classics. And so really it's like a, it's a weird type of knowledge where it's like, it's like, imagine if it was like, imagine if like in our country, like if you wanted to become, you know, not president, but if you wanted to become like a local mayor or a local governor or something like that, it would require you to know a lot of Shakespeare or something. Like you had to really, really know all the details and you could be able to, to recite Shakespeare from, uh, from memory or something like that. Um, and these exams were extremely uh, difficult. Um, so really, you only, there's like these different levels, but you could see at the highest level, the passing rate is, you know, less than 2%. Uh, percent. And so the educational systems are really focused on training students to take these tests. And so when we think about it, traditionally, we say, okay, there's a strong correlation between education and growth, that these two are complementary, uh, comp complements to each other, where typically, as your country gets more educated, um, it gets wealthier, because people who are educated, you know, they have skills, they come up with better ways to do things, they're more efficient, they're more productive. Um, but in this case, this type of education we can see is not necessarily conducive to becoming more productive, more efficient, coming up with new um, uh, inventions. And so it's really, it's just like rote learning. Um, and so you can see maybe throughout this period of Chinese, Chinese history, their human capital was uh, misallocated in terms of these are, these are the, these are, these are, these are the intellectual elites. Um, you know, they could have been, you know, scientists, engineers, something else. Um, rather than, you know, essentially uh, bureaucrats who really knew Confucian classics uh, really well. Okay, but, the, but it's such an interesting system because it's very progressive in that it's, it's for, the, for, for its time, and it has, this, it has this kind of built in equality of opportunity where kind of anybody can have uh, entry into this, um, into, 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 these, uh, 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 into this gentry class of, of bureaucrats. So the status is not um, in inherited. Um, the exams were expensive, so you had to pay to take the exams, but it was not necessarily out of reach. So for poor families, they would pool their resources um, you know, to, uh, to pay for the exams um, for, uh, you know, for, for children that were promising. So, so it's like, all right, so I will pay for my sons. So this was, this was limited to males. So you will pay for your, um, your, your sons to get educated. And if they show promise, it's like the whole clan can then pool their resources to focus in on a few, uh, you know, children um, that, show, that show extreme promise. Um, and then the exams themselves were, were, uh, were blind. So again, this is all like anybody can take this, sorry, any male can take these exams. Um, you know, elites do not get preferential treatment. Um, um, and then the exams are great. So you can't like bribe a grader or something like that. So it's incredibly, it's incredibly merit, uh, meritocratic system. Now the elites have the advantage in that they can, the richer you are, you can pay for more, um, you know, you can pay for more like training, you could pay for, um, you know, better learning, better tutoring for your kids. Um, but when it comes time to do the exam, it's, it's an even playing field. Like everybody's going to get uh, graded um, uh, blindly. All right. And, but there's also, the, there's also this idea then from the lower classes that education is a pathway uh, upwards. All right. That you, if you invest in education, um, this is a way that you can better your, uh, better your, uh, your social situation. Um, and this will persist, this idea will persist um, 
into and into the present. Okay. And so what happens is, so you have, you know, you know China has this imperial exam system. Um, and it's, like I said, it's really focused on, um, focused on learning these Confucian uh, classics. The question is, why not pivot? Why not just change the exams so that it focuses on math or science or engineering of some kind? Why, you know, why not change the exams as we see that this type of knowledge is perhaps more valuable um, as the world starts to um, uh, in, in, in industrialize? Um, and so really this is like a political economy story where the existing elites, the existing you know, uh, uh, elites who have gone through the system and the emperor fear that, okay, if we reform, it kind of says, hey, you know what you guys were learning before maybe wasn't as, as useful. So you should learn this instead. And, and oh, by the way, we got our positions because that's what we learned. So then it's kind of discrediting themselves. And so uh, really this, you know, the system gets codified and it's just like they don't really alter it or reform it. Um, and they kind of put the stigma on, on learning other types of education. So it's not only we're not going to reform our system, but we're going to stigmatize this uh, other system. Um, and so if you learn like Western style knowledge, like Western science and, uh, you know, engineering, that is, you know, that, that's going to be uh, frown, frowned upon. So they do add like a Western style track that has, you know, the type of science that's going on um, in, in, in Europe at the time. Um, but, you know, they, they stigmatize it. So it's like only, you know, only kind of, if you're, if you're like elite and you're doing well um, in the traditional track, you're going to stay in the traditional track. Um, and so they don't, you know, they don't alter this. This, sir, this is stark contrast to what happens in Japan. So Japan also turns inward. So remember we have politically, China has turned inward, um, you know, essentially in the 1400s. Japan turns inward um, in the 1500s uh, after the Tokugawa uh, shogunate. They really, really turn uh, inward. Um, but in the 1850s, um, Japan opens up. Essentially, uh, Commodore Perry from the US brings like a fleet of US ships into Japan to open Japan up. And Japan looks at the ships and realizes they are behind technologically. And they say, all right, we need to, you know, really change what we're doing here because these Western powers are so much more advanced technologically. And they kind of transform their educational system and really adopt a more Western style educational system. And this then kicks off an industrialization in Japan. Japan essentially develops very rapidly. The first non-Western power to go through the Industrial Revolution, they do this in the late 1800s. And essentially they become so advanced that they're able to defeat a Western power, Russia, uh, by, uh, by the turn of the uh, 20th century. By you know, the early 1900s, they defeat uh, Russia in the Russian-Japanese uh, War. So essentially J Japan says, whoa, okay, we need to adopt this. this these powers are more, uh, more technologically developed than us. We, they, they may try to subjugate us. Um, so we need to develop you know, quickly and rapidly. <laughs> That's... Uh, just quickly, you know, quickly and rapidly. Uh, you don't need both. Um, so, and they essentially are able to uh, accomplish this in the back half of, uh, of, of the 19th century. China says, we're not gonna do that. We are gonna stay true to our culture, uh, which is, you know, kind of based on these Confucian classics. We are not going to uh, change what we're doing. Okay, and so finally, but finally it's like, all right, we've, you know, we've lost the opium wars we're clearly falling behind the rest of the world. So we need to change the system. So finally in 1905, they change it. And then soon after it completely upends the whole political system. So the elites are right, it undermined their, their, the justification for their power and the emperor abdicates in, uh, in 1912. And the modern system kind of takes off. And this modern system does translate into you know, innovation higher productivity. Uh, this is according to a Yuckman paper from uh, 2017. So they, they keep with it for a long time, but they finally modernize in the early, uh, early 20th century. Okay. And so there are other long run effects. So we can have kind of this, this period, I mean, they had this exam for a very long period of time. You know, most things don't, you know, there are very few things in human history uh, that last for, uh, you know, so this, this is from 600 
to, to, uh, to 1900. So 1300 years. There are very few things that last for 1300 years uh, in human history. But this exam system, you know, persisted. And it really has other effects. Um, and so, uh, so there is this, uh, this effect that there's education is venerated. So education is respected. Um, and that there are, you know, lots of books, lots of scholarship. Um, and this is kind of central to uh, Chinese culture. And so there's this hot, this value placed on, on education that really persists uh, to the present. Now this, you know, once that education shifts from traditional to a more modern style of education, this really pays dividends for growth because you have a highly educated uh, uh, workforce. Um, and this is, uh, so this is, sorry, this is showing the correlation between areas, uh, that had, um, success on the, uh, on the, on the, on the civil exam, um, and schooling today. So you can see basically areas that were more concentrated on that traditional schooling or did better on the traditional schooling are, uh, are more educated today. And the argument is this is because there's this, this cultural value of education that persists once we switch. Uh, our educational uh, systems. Okay. All right, and then here's one more poem, kind of, again, en enforcing this idea. To enrich your family, no need to buy good land. Books hold a thousand measures of grain. For an easy life, no need to build a mansion. In books are found houses of gold. Going out, be not vexed at absence of followers. In books, carriages and horses form a crowd. Marrying, be not vexed by lack of a good go-between. In books, there are girls with faces of jade. A boy who wants to become somebody devotes himself to the classics, faces the window, and reads. So it's like, hey, hey, books, they're where it's at. Aren't books cool? That's my summary. That's my, uh, uh, my summary of, uh, of the poem. But again, it's just showing the, you know, how permeated this idea is of the importance of uh, education. All right, let's take a break.